The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. Well then, Bonifornication, yes. this, this week on the Pope on Film, we are saying hello to Cleveland! Hello, Cleveland! This week... Fart town! I, all of your humor is centered around farts right now, and it's just <laughs> wonderful. You should stay should stay like this forever, Maxwell. This week on the Pope on Film, we are doing the episode in Dubly. Yes. Do podcasts in Dubly. This week, we are spending so much money dressing ourselves as animals. Mm-hmm. This week... Yes, yes, I, we get it. You're adding fart to everything. This week on the Pope on Film, we are locating mandolin strings in the middle of Austin. Damn it, Jim, this episode, we're going to 11. <laughs> yes, we are finally doing the classic American comedy masterpiece, Jack and Jill, starring Adam Sandler. Ha! You just got shyamalan <laughs> Twist ending. What, Maxwell? You want to show everybody a piece of black uh, Play-Doh? Somebody's really excited about the live aspect of the Pope on film. A yeah. Piece of. Gotcha. Gotcha. And if you push it, you can make it into. If you roll, you do this. It's scary. Okay. You can make it long. Gotcha. Snakes. Okay. Yeah. Or 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 a or a lizard turd. So I'm gonna try and do my podcast now. Is that all right, Maxwell? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um. No, we are not doing Jack and Jill. We are not doing any more Adam Sandler movies. So you ever. can be. You can feel. Ever. So you can be. Happy about that. Interesting side note, I believe I mentioned this before, but that film, Jack and Jill, starring Adam Sandler, features the Latin American actor that you now know as Dario Cueto. Oh, okay. Because yeah, they didn't get some guy and then have him pretend and, and then say, okay, from now on, you have to act like you're the owner of... Lucha Underground. We need to fool people into thinking this is real. They just said, no, we're going to hire an actor. And they yeah. hired an actor. <laughs> and he acts because it's a TV show. And I love that. It's a, such a wonderfully different way to look at professional wrestling. He's just a freaking actor. He was in Jack and Jill. <laughs> but I'm glad that you brought up the name Adam Sandler, me. Because as you may well know, or perhaps you blocked it out of your memory like an abuse victim, but last week... On the Big Shoe, we did Adam Sandler's new movie for Netflix titled Sandy Wexler. And the best thing that you can say about this film is that they did a good job of making sure the camera stayed in focus. Yes. Literally everything else about this film sucks more than porn star Sarah J in the Oakland Raiders locker room. That might be an outdated <laughs> sports rep. That the Oakland Raiders are moving, or maybe they've already moved, but I don't give a fuck. And I have always been a firm believer of what I call cleansing the palate. Cleansing for example, the palate, yes. For example, you watch Cannibal Holocaust, and that's a, a, an insanely depressing, effed up head trip featuring actual animal slaughtering, and you need to get that out of your head. So you cleanse your mind of the heinousness of Cannibal Holocaust with... Charlie Brown's history of mental and physical abuse, race for your life, Charlie Brown. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I would do that when I would watch a horror movie. I'm like, oh, man, Hostel 2 is really fucked up. I need to watch Care Bears now. Yes. <laughs> Just to kind of clean Eli Roth off of me. Oh, God. You always have to clean the Eli Roth. Even if you see him just like in an interview, you have to clean the Eli Roth off of you. Yeah. So this week, we are hosing off the depressing hideousness of Adam Sandler with a good comedy, an actual funny one, a film with an actual soul, 
a film that this week does not feature Conan O'Brien so desperate to escape that he gnaws his own foot off. Yes. Yes. Yes, my loyal poppies, this week, we're finally doing Spinal Tarp. Yes. And let me just let me just say that Bunny and I are really big fans of Spinal Tap, not your music specifically, but just rock and roll in general. Yes. Mm-hmm. Hey, kids. Hey, kids. Do you like Spinal Tap references? Then you've come to the <laughs> right podcast. Now, before we go any further with Spinal Tap, Let's take one of our trademark asides for a bit, if we may. Yes. And talk about how freaking old I am now. (laughs) I'm freaking 40 now, and I don't know when that happened, but like the alien ships from Plan 9 from Outer Space, my 40s came suddenly and without warning. (laughs) Like... I always liked the movie When Harry Met Sally. Yeah. I always thought that was a really good movie and really well written. But the other day I tried to watch it and I realized I'm older than them now. Yes. And that really sort of hit. Every, like watching When Harry Met Sally when I'm like 10 or 12 or 15 or even 21 years old, it always seemed to be a movie about older people wrestling with older things. Yeah. And older older people and their relationships. And now I'm looking at When Harry Met Sally and seeing people younger than me dealing with relationships. And it's really creepy to me that I that I that I lacked the movie. You know, <laughs> it's weird that now I'm watching so, the movie and and uh, and what's her name uh, is is freaking out. I'm going to be 40. Yeah. Yeah. And four years. And it's like, oh shit, no, I'm already there. Uh-huh. That's so weird. I'm for older me, than the people. For me, growing up, it was it was when everything I loved or things that I experienced, anything like that, when that hit the twenty year mark. Like you were fucking kidding me. John Lennon is dead twenty years. No. No. Star Wars is 20 years. Star Trek. <sighs> that's that's when I when I really started feeling it. I read somewhere I read somewhere like a two or maybe three years ago that everyone in college now were not a, that 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 the, the people coming into college right now, like college freshmen, they were never alive when. Uh, Kurt Cobain was a lot. <laughs> yeah, that really depressed me. I got, that that really, I that felt, really hit me in the gut. I felt really old when I realized, or when I was at the wedding of somebody that I knew as a baby. Yeah, she was a yep. baby. I mean, I knew her, and then and now she's a grandmother. Yeah. Okay, that's really scary. Somebody that I, I knew as a newborn baby is now a grandmother. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god! <laughs> Just said that out loud. Um, I really like Bruno Kirby. What is he doing? I'm sure Bruno, he's doing something, though. Because he was in both When Harry Met Sally and he was in Spinal Tap, so this is really the Bruno Kirby episode. He was in The Godfather. Yeah, he was in Godfather. Well, he was in Godfather we gotta, too. Yeah, one day we got to do an episode just in tribute of um, Abe Bagoda. Yes. Because again, again, I love saying this: any man who was in The Godfather and the Nickelodeon film Good Burger, that is a career trajectory that needs to be studied in depth. Yes. Because that's. How do you even do that? I'm amazed by that. So anyway, I'm 40 now. I would like to think that I look pretty somewhat fairly goodish for being 40. Seriously, Google image search 40-year-old male, and the results look pretty goddamn dismal. It's basically you're watching any episode of Cops. I don't think I I don't think I look that old is what I'm saying. Yeah. No. I think I look pretty old. 
What, Maxwell? This comes out of a so so. Oh. So, when, when I come yeah. out. It just came out like that. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But there are signs, I think, subtle signs. I think that, that if you got yourself in the right place at the right time, you would still have a shot with Taylor Swift. Yeah. Thank Granted, you. thank you. your genes wouldn't be pure enough, you know, yeah. but that would be the only, it, it would not be a matter of your age. I am going for Loki hair. Yeah. And Taylor Swift did date Loki, so <laughs> that that is a possibility. Um, there are some signs, though, that I'm getting older, small signs, yeah. subtle signs, long-haired freaky people need not apply signs. Uh huh. Signs everywhere. A sign, blocking, blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Breaking my mind. Mel Gibson, breathe didn't, like me. Aliens are afraid of water. Signs. Didn't the band from the Gilmore Girls cover that song? Probably. Hep alien, hep alien. Yeah. Just want to say, I'm the type of man that knows that knowledge without looking it up. Just. I know the band is Hep Alien. I just want to take this time to say that I knew Gilmore Girls before knowing Gilmore Girls was cool. <laughs> there are some subtle but signs I'm pretty sure out Sebastian there Bach I... was involved in, in a cover of that song. I, I love the fact that Sebastian Bach was in fucking Gilmore Girls. I just love that. I love that so much. <laughs> I love that. I have more respect for him. Hey. Because of that. That's just a pretty awesome move on his part. So I have a list. I have a short list yeah. in no particular order of signs that I am old now. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go through this list. Signs that I am old. Number one. Dabbing. Dabbing. I, I don't get this. I don't get dabbing. I don't see what the deal is. Like, why? You put your forehead to your uh, inner elbow. Why would I do that? I just don't get it. I just don't get it. <laughs> Emerald, does it. Emerald does it. I've seen her do it. I think she's doing it ironically because she thinks she's all cool, little Miss Daria or whatever. But she does it. Amber does it all the time because Amber is Amber. But I just don't see why I would ever want to do that. Yeah. I don't see what the deal is. Number two, my knees. <laughs> my knee. I'm not sure if you know this. Super. Wait a Nintendo, second. Wait a second. My... Though we must be talking about two different kinds of dabbing. Oh, definitely. No, the, the, the <laughs> dab. You know, when you when you put your hand to your forehead, you put your you put your elbow to your forehead. That's dabbing. Maxwell, you know how to dab. Okay, come over here no, I've... Cam. Okay. okay, come over here and dab. Yeah, that's a dab. That's a dab, yeah. There you go. I don't see... Yeah, that's dabbing. Thank you, Max, for the visual component. If anyone is watching on the Pope on Film Live, that's a dab. I don't see why I would dab. Okay. But I dab sometimes. You dab sometimes, that's fine. You're young. You have your youth, Maxwell. I'm 40. Sorry. I, we lost the stream there for a little bit. Oh, we did? Yeah, not... But we're still we're still recording. We still got this? Right. We're still recording as we normally do every week. This is just added. So we're fine. We're just not streaming at the moment. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. It's just like everything else. You know, we're going to have to work out the little bugs if it's not perfect the first time. Give me a break, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. So, my knees. Your knees. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you realize this, but my knees are part of a balanced breakfast. <laughs> Do you know why my knees are part of a balanced breakfast? No. Because they're always snapping, crackling, and popping. <laughs> I the other day I was in the I was in the 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 bedroom and I no I was in the living room and I was looking for something that someone dropped and I was bent down and then I stood up from a crouched down position and apparently Bella had not had not been around me at, at, 
when I had ever done this before. So she just heard my knees and went, oh, my God, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm like, I, that's just what my knees do now, okay? That's, yeah. to pr- please try not to make that a thing because it, it, it's just my knees, okay? That's just what they do. Just how it is. <laughs> yeah. Number three, there is some music I don't understand. Okay. I, I heard I, I've heard some music from the band The Chainsmokers. It's like bro techno pop. Yes. I do not get it at all. I, I like the band Twenty One Pilots, but there are times when I listen to their music that I feel so goddamn uncool. <laughs> Like, I'm not sure if I should be allowed to like this music. Like my dad, when I when when I was young, my dad decided that he loved the song Kiss by Prince. And he's just, I love this song, Stevie. I love this song Kiss by Prince. I'm a big Prince fan now. And I just remember going, shut the hell up. You know, you don't know Prince. You Prince? You don't know Prince? Dad? <laughs> No prince, you don't like this man. You have no clue who this person is. You now, have no idea. Just drop this now. And now you'll never be able to listen to Prince again because your dad likes him. Yeah. yeah. Ridiculous. Dad loved the song Kiss by Prince. Um number four. Uh, unfortunately, this is just what happens. This is what aging yep. is, and this is why I leave millennials alone. Because I am, I am just watching the older generation become the older generation, and picking on the younger generation for the same shit that they always have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The previous generation, that generation, their generation, not ours. They've always been lazy motherfuckers. Turn Every down. generation. Oh, oh! You're striking a mood over there. <laughs> yeah. The blue light came on. Maxwell keeps turning the light off. <laughs> um, of my dad. Speaking of my dad. Speaking of my wonderful freaking uh, childhood. Yeah. Golf. 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 I always hated golf. Mm-hmm. But recently, I think every sane person does. But recently. God damn it, I understand it now. Yeah. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. My dad loved going golfing. He would go golfing every Saturday, every Sunday. He would go off and he would golf. And he would just, he would go and golf. And I never understood it. There were some times where he would take me. And I never liked golf because my dad was always such a fucking uh, mice, uh, like a penny pincher, a miser. Yeah. That he would never get a golf cart. Uh huh. So we just do 18 holes of golf on foot. <laughs> and it's just like we're doing so much walking to hit a fucking ball and I just don't get it. But I would always I would always try and go with him as much as I could for the primary reason of afterwards we would go to the restaurant. Yes. We would go to like the club and they had they oh they had a buffet that was open well, all it, the time and it was really yeah. expensive and we, we got it after a game of golf and oh my god their fries were just so fucking good and it's like i'll sit through 18 holes of shit with my dad if i can just eat all of the fries and ice cream i want (laughs) you know well for for me it was but for me it was fishing and just mm -hmm. like god damn what do i have to do to have a fucking bonding experience with this old motherfucker But now I get it. I have five kids in this goddamn house. Mm -hmm. I have five kids in this goddamn house. I come home, and every time I come home, my wife is already stressed out to the limit from dealing with these kids. So I come home after a hard day of work, and she's just like, oh, my God, thank God you're here. Here, take the kids. Take them. (laughs) Take them. I just need some time for myself. So so I, I never get any time. For the only time I get for myself is the 45 minutes when I'm driving to and from work, yeah, and that's pretty much about it. So I don't get a lot of time. So suddenly, like a, a couple of days ago, like a light bulb hit in my head. My dad didn't like golf, he just wanted to get away from us. 
Like it, it, golf was never about golf. He just never wanted to be a fucking dad. Uh-huh. And so he one thing in his life where he could just say, all right, I'm gone for four hours. Bye. <laughs> I'm going to go hit a ball around and then afterwards drink a lot. Yes. With a bunch of random dudes. I'm going to have some time away to myself where I get to just not be a father. And it's like, God damn it. I kind of get that. Can I golf? <laughs> I start golfing. Do I have to buy clubs? I can't rent them. Do they sell them at Goodwill? Can I just well, I you're not, you're thing? not, you're not a golf type, okay? But the the new world that we have come into does have options for you. Uh, you could become a zombie walk enthusiast. You True. know, True. Uh, cosplay. Everybody, these cosplay. kids today, they love the fucking cosplay, don't they? They do. Um, <laughs> you know, so like that's an option reason, for you. Like, cosplay is a word I've heard a bajillion times, but for some reason, when you said cosplay, I just pictured cosplay as just being dressing up as Bill Cosby. <laughs> I'm calling bullshit on that because I, I know, because like I know. You've typed cosplay into you porn at least once. <laughs> oh, I really like the parody porn that they make. <laughs> There's a lot of porn out there, and it's really good. Yeah. And a lot of people who kind of look a lot like Harley Quinn. <laughs> so, so golf. I get golf now. I get golf. I get golf. I, I, I have, I hate my dad, but God damn it. I understand wanting to just leave for five hours. Well, then I think that's that's an advantage I, I have not ha- not having had kids. I can still hate golf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Golf. Um, number five, NPR. NPR. Enough said. Just NPR. Yeah. Just NPR. And the last one is one that I am actually vaguely ashamed of, but I'm not exactly sure why. Mm-hmm. I am a Big ass fan of the magazine Bloomberg Business Week. <laughs> huge, fan, huge ass fan. Most of their articles are boring shit, but for every 12 boring ass articles, there's an article about something I care about. Like a couple of weeks ago, there was a great article about how ESPN is in the shit house. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because apparently, just, just, it, it, ESPN is a huge victim of the fact that people just fucking hate cable nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, people hate cable. You can just subscribe to HBO Go. You can just subscribe to uh, Hulu and Amazon and Netflix, and you just don't need fucking cable anymore. So ESPN is fucking failing, and it's just going down the tubes. And then you think, oh, poor ESPN. Not only are people not watching, well, see, okay, okay, but you have. Like a hundred networks. There's like HB, you know, ESPN 10 and ESPN College Eastern Division, and you you have so many channels and no one's watching any of them. Like, oh, poor, poor ESPN. I love that. Yes, but that's why I want us you to know? have a channel out there. I at least want us in the stream somewhere. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I you understand. know, as more people turn to streaming yeah. options. Because that's what you're doing with HBO or, or Showtime or anything like that. And you could do, do all of that on the Roku. You know, I think you could do that yeah. on any of the platforms. You know? Yeah. So we're yeah, out there. On, we are out there. I had, I had the link up for the Roku channel earlier. So please, hey, please, I'll put it up again. But please subscribe. Yeah. So this week on the big show... We are. We will actually be talking about not one, but two recent Bloomberg Business Week articles. Boom! You just got <laughs> Shyamalan again. <laughs> Double Shyamalan. Yeah. Because this week's episode was an idea that originated through another recent Bloomberg Business Week article entitled "This Lawsuit Goes to 11. Yes. I I, I haven't caught the latest news, but I know. Uh... What's his name? Shearer. 
Yeah, he's a troublemaker, apparently. Derek, Derek he's a Smolos. big troublemaker. They talked about it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So it's story time, everybody. It's the story of the making of Spinal Tap, and more importantly, it's the story of the finances of Spinal Tap. That's the interesting part. Yeah. I'm really proud of this story time because Spinal Tap is one of those movies where everybody just knows everything about everything. Yes. So, so thanks to my bizarre love of Bloomberg Business Week, I have an angle for this movie that not a lot of people know about, so I'm really excited about that. So, in 1978, Harry Shearer, Rob Reiner, Christopher Guest, and Michael McKeon were very, very lightly batting around the idea of creating a totally real fake band. Yeah. So their first appearance as Spinal Tap is on the pilot for a variety show in 1979 that was called The TV Show. It aired once on ABC, and it featured uh, Billy Crystal, and like all things on television in the late 70s, it also featured Wolfman Jack. Okay, yeah. It was law in America if you had a TV show in the 70s, Wolfman Jack had to be it. Yes. It didn't matter what it was. Including game The show. Johnny Cash show. Yeah. Hollywood Squares. It didn't matter what it was. But it was pretty awesome that time he... It was pretty awesome when he was on yeah. with Julia Child, man. Yeah. So we're going to be cutting up these onions. Yeah! Yeah, that was fun. Wolfman Jack Wolf. for me is one of those people where I love the idea of Wolfman Jack more than I love Wolfman Jack. Was he that tends his to real... get on my nerves pretty fucking quickly. <laughs> Was that his real voice, or did he uh, macho man himself? I think he macho man himself. Yeah, well, so he fact, was one of those people fact, where it's... You hear his real voice in American Graffiti. Okay, yeah. Because he so was he's pretending just one like of those he guys was not like, Wolfman Jack. Yeah. So he's one of those guys like Macho Man Randy Savage where it's like, hello, how are you doing? I am a young Randolph Savage. Yeah, I, I use a different name when I'm professional wrestling, but it's okay because I don't think I'm going to be wrestling that long. Yeah. So it won't have a direct effect on me. And then finally you see... Macho Man Randy Savage and 62 years old going to McDonald's. Can I get a number? And could I get that supersized? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why is your voice like that? I didn't think I'd be on TV for that long, brother. <laughs> so he just got stuck with this horrible voice. Well, because he just did it for so long, he just got stuck. With that voice. I yeah. felt like Wolfman Jack was the same way. Well, right. How I, I, it makes me wonder how long do you have to put on that voice and use that voice before it just becomes your friggin' voice? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Bone saw is ready. <laughs> so, uh, Spinal Tap's first appearance on the TV show is on YouTube, and they do a song, and it's an okay song, but the video is so. Uh, the video of them being on the TV show it, is so earnest yeah, and, and so serious and so not funny at all that there's nothing in it to distinguish it from any other actual band. So it's a bit weird. Yeah. It's like they did a funny bit, they forgot to be funny. So they're really just, at that point, you're not a fake band, you're just a band. So it's a bit, it's a bit odd. Also, they look funny. They obviously hadn't settled on their look yet. Yes, but so, I do think so, I do think that Spinal Tap had to wait. If they if it would have come out yeah. at the time when they had shot that piece, you know, it, it wouldn't have flew. It we really need to get to the whole hair band thing. Yeah, yeah. So for so Spinal this Tap is actually, to really work, they are perfect in that. Yeah. So anyway, they thought they had a something. So they got together $10,000 and they filmed a 20-minute proof of concept. Yeah. 
a proof of concept. To be able to, to take that proof of concept and show it to various studios to show that they had something funny, it was called Spinal Tap, The Final Tour. And it is remarkably interesting to see the fact that it's 1979 and it, it, they already have so much yeah. set up. It's remarkable to see, like, you see Spinal Tap and you hear, like, okay, a lot of this is ad-libbed and there wasn't really a script, so they were probably kind of and, flying by the seat yeah. of their... But then you see this, which is, like, five years later, and so much of the movie This Is Spinal Tap is already set in stone in the 70s. E even, some know, shots, even some full shots. Even some full shots came straight from there. Yeah. Yeah, there's all the dead drummers, there's... The originals and the new originals. There's the mm -hmm. metal detector scene. There's a Paul Benedict working at the hotel. Yeah. I'm just as God made me. So. <laughs> There's their small Stonehenge. Like they already have so much set up. And there was some they extra. Actually... I caught some extra in the background, and I forget who the fuck it was. He was doing the um, and I forget what the fuck his name was. David Letterman, David Letterman's band guy, Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer in Spinal yeah. Tap. They were doing the Are same scene. What yes. Yeah. But in that clip it Are was somebody it was somebody else. It wasn't Paul Schaefer. But I think it might have been like yeah. Quentin Tarantino or somebody like really surprising. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Artie Fupkin, Polymer Records. <laughs> they actually use a bit of the demo footage in the actual film. Like they use um, uh, their "Give Me Some Money." They use yes. that footage in there, and then that uh, spaced out woman in the in in the outside of the concert. Yes, she was awesome. Yes, yeah, she, she that was also from the. It, it's very interesting. It's on YouTube. You should see it. it, it it's interesting to see how much they already had set up. So from 1980 to 1982, they get their proof of concept and they're, they're, they're taking it from studio to studio and they were rejected by every studio in existence. No one wanted Spinal Tap. No one wanted Spinal Tap at all. A lot of, pe a lot of studios uh, were so convinced by the way that they filmed it that they had no idea that, they, that the band was fake. Like, the, it was so good yeah. that people were just... Well, why would we want to make a movie about a band no one's heard of? No one has heard of this band. That's the problem. <laughs> is that no one's heard of the Spinal Tap band you've made this film about. But it even becomes funnier now. Because, again, I watch a lot of music documentaries for some strange fucking reason. Yeah. yeah. There are documentaries on nobody bands shot by members or former members of that band <laughs> you know <laughs> so it becomes even more plausible now of course why wouldn't there be a documentary on spinal tap i really why is like, there a documentary on big star i really like the documentary about the band the bare naked ladies yeah and I like the documentary because number one, they're 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 actually a really funny band live. Even if you don't like or cannot recall any of their music, they're really fun to see live. Number one, and number two, the documentary was done by Jason Priestley from Nine Hundred Two One Zero. Yeah, and it was done because he spent so much time in America, and he realized, oh shit, people only know Canada as the home of Celine Dion. <laughs> shit we need to change that i need to find a band and make a documentary about them and bring it to america because i'll be damned if people think that canada that that music in canada is just celine dion oh hell no <laughs> so he saw the documentary as a public service like hey here are these great guys they're really nice their music is is uh, wonderful and they're funny and here's the best thing they're not fucking celine dion yeah. So like that's a really great reason to do a movie. So I really respect that film. It's a really good film. Anyway, mm -hmm. eventually, after years and years and years of rejection, they get a mere $2 million to do a film for Embassy Pictures. And they only get this deal. The only reason they get $2 million 
from Embassy Pictures is because at that time, Embassy Pictures was run by Norman freaking Lear. Okay. Did All in the Family with Rob Reiner years and years back. That's the only reason that they eventually finally got someone, anyone, to pick up Spinal Tap yeah. is because, uh, oh, I, I know a guy who knows a guy, yada, yada, yada. That's the only reason they picked it up, mm. period. So it, it helps to know people in the business, I get. And also, just $2 million. That is not a lot of money. Yeah. Even in, yeah, even in like 1980. Two, not a lot. They of must have gotten some more money someplace else because there, there are parts there that were really good. The concerts, yeah, yeah. mostly. Uh -huh. So, um, interesting fact. Interesting fact. To drum up business for the movie, Spinal Tap uh, was the actual musical guest on an episode of Saturday Night Live in the eighties. <laughs> nice. Season 9, episode 18, hosted by Barry Bostwick. Oh, my God. They do two musical numbers, and then in the middle of the musical numbers, they do a very serious interview with the members of Spinal Tap. And it's like, hi, I'm Barry Bostwick, and I'm here talking with our musical guest this week, Spinal Tap. And it's a cute little, like, five-minute skit. The, the, the part that I remember is he says... A lot of people say that your song Big Bottom is actually sexist towards women. And what they try and, and spin it as is it's not sexist. And I'll tell you why. We're not talking about a whole woman. We're just talking about her butt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how, how can we be sexist if we're just talking about a woman's butt? We're not talking about the whole woman. Mm -hmm. It's not like the butt is saying, hey, being sexist to me, a butt. <laughs> so we're not. We're not being sexist to, to women. We're, we're getting a part of that woman, and we're treating it like an object. There's nothing sexist about that. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. But Gene, yeah, Spinal Gene Tap just gave me a dirty look. <laughs> <laughs> so Spinal Tap came out. It did poorly. The end. This has been a good episode of the Pope on Phil. Yes, it has. I think this has been a great episode. So until next but week. But then it was released on video, it was released on Laserdisc, and because it did so bad in theaters, the rights to it were pretty goddamn cheap. So it started playing on TV and cable all the time. As a kid, it seemed like, which is weird because you already said this about something else, but as a kid, my grandparents would have HBO and we would see HBO at, at my grandparents' house. Yeah. And it seemed like Spinal Tap was always on HBO yes. in the late 80s. Oh, and the then later, like, then later on Comedy Central, it was like the only fucking movie they had. Yeah, it was on all the time. It was always on HBO. So the film exploded, basically, and now it's seen as a modern classic. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. And there's a quote halfway through the article that really does explain the entire rest of the story. The quote is from David Zucker. Yes. And he says that his film Airplane made so much money and it was such a big hit that, quote, the studio couldn't hide the money fast enough. <laughs> that is basically the rest of the story. Yes. So, um, Sheer guest McKeon and Reiner have a share of all of the worldwide merchandising income, which includes soundtrack sales from this movie soundtrack dvd anything that sells that spinal tab they get a percentage of and a decent percentage of it so in 2013 harry shearer says hey uh i haven't really gotten a dime from you guys at all so i want to know what that amount is so in 2013, Shear and Guest and McKeon and Reiner, their share of worldwide merchandising income mm -hmm. from 1984 to 2006, split between four people, was $81. Oh, wow. So that's 81 divided by four. So that is whatever that is, because I'm horrible at fucking but math. That, but this is an old, old Hollywood story, you know? No movie in the history of Hollywood 
has ever, ever made any money. Okay? Yeah. And if you remember what? back, if you remember back as we were kind of leading up to um, The Force Awakens and things like that, Peter Mayhew had yeah. never seen any fucking money. Chewbacca had never yeah. seen any fucking money because yeah. Star Wars never made any money. Yeah. Did you know that despite that despite making almost one billion dollars in worldwide ticket sales, Warner Brothers claims that Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire co- uh, it made them lose one hundred and sixty-seven million dollars. Mm-hmm. The film co- the film made one billion dollars worldwide just that one Harry Potter movie, but they lost hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. They n- never made a profit. And allegedly the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy which made a combined oh, 3 yeah. billion dollars worldwide saw quote horrendous losses. Mhm. So yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, Peter it, and it, Peter it, Jackson was suing over that too. And I yeah. think they finally worked out a deal so that he could do the Hobbit. Because if you remember, The Hobbit was originally going to be Guillermo del Toro. Yeah. But but Hollywood says, oh, yeah, you can have a percentage of, of uh, the grosses uh, after, you know, if this movie makes money. So then the studio says, yeah, sorry, but I know this film was, seems really successful. Yeah. But we actually didn't make any money from Forrest Gump. <laughs> sorry. Sorry You can't have a percentage. That. Because no one, yeah, no one went to go see Forrest Gump. It, it, it was a loss for us. I read an article for this episode mm-hmm. of uh, movies that allegedly made no money. It, it's yeah. ridiculous to think that Forrest Gump made no money. Mm-hmm. Forrest Gump lost hundreds of millions of dollars for the studio. That's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so they're, they're, Combined share of worldwide merchandising income from 1984 to 2006 was $81. Not 8100 81000 81 freaking dollars. Which makes sense because no one has ever bought a Spinal Tap DVD. No. Ever. No one ever owns it. No one has ever owned Spinal Tap, ever. The soundtrack sales from 1989 to 2006 amounted to $98 was their cut. Uh-huh. So that means that... Some people have bought the Spinal Tap soundtrack, but only about 100. Yeah. Only about 100 people have ever bought the Spinal Tap soundtrack. So, um, yeah, so basically no one ever bought a Spinal Tap DVD. No one has ever purchased the Spinal Tap soundtrack. Damn you, Napster! (laughs) Look at how you have ruined us. So now all four of these gentlemen are suing the now owners of the Spinal Tap rights. It bounced around for a long time. For a while, apparently, Coca-Cola owned the rights to Spinal Tap. Really? Okay. But, yeah. but now it's owned by Vivendi, and the soundtrack is owned by Sony Music. But Vivendi also licenses some of Spinal Tap to their, to their uh, corporate partner, Universal uh, Music, and a lot of people say that that's that's the way that companies um, keep rights from artists by saying, OK, so um, you will get some money from Forrest Gump. And now we have Forrest Gump, but we are going to give some of the rights to Forrest Gump to our parent company, uh, Anchor Universal. Mm-hmm. And then we. When Tom Hanks comes in and says, "Hey, I want the rights to Forrest Gump. Open. I want. I want my money from Forrest Gump. Open your books." They say, "Okay, here are our books." Yeah. And then they say, "Wait a second. Forrest Gump is also owned by this other company, mm-hmm. Anchor Universal. I want to see their books too." And that's when the the studio is literally uh, legally allowed to say, "Sorry, you can only see our books. You can't see their books." Yeah. That's a different company. So whatever the amount is here in our books, that is what we legally have to give to you. So that's one of the reasons why the Spinal Tap people are suing for this. Yeah. Uh, Way back in the 80s, the contract that they signed with MSC Pictures gave them a percentage of the film's income, including merchandising and soundtrack sales. And the contract – but here's the reason why – 
the Spinal Tap uh, lawsuit might be different than the Peter Jackson lawsuit, might be different than all of the other lawsuits out there, is that the contract was signed so early in the 80s, way before studios put clauses in the contract that made them basically lawyer-proof. Oh, okay. So that's one of the reasons why this case specifically is such a big deal. It's a it's such a rare chance that the boys are also suing to reclaim the copyright to the name Spinal Tap. Yeah. So this is a case with a surprisingly large amount of Hollywood uh, implications. They're suing for four hundred million dollars in damages. Ooh. Some people say that they're only suing for one hundred and twenty five million, but the Bloomberg article said four hundred million. But that I think they're I think it's two different numbers. We're suing you for 125 million, but of course, with damages and all that, it's going to equal 400 million. But uh, whatever, they're suing for a shit ton of money. Yes, and they're suing for the rights to the name Spinal Tap, and 400 million seems like a lot. But damn it, if you do the math, if you actually do the math here, then okay. So they're entitled to five percent of all merchandising revenue. So if Vivendi tells them the truth. Oh, here is the truth. You only get $81. Then that means that in 20 years, Spinal Tap only made $1,620 in merchandising. Mm -hmm. And that includes DVD sales, so that number cannot in any way be right. No. And, yeah, uh, so uh, the article really is interesting. It goes to great lengths to explain the shady practices of Hollywood accountants. Apparently, Hollywood is as open with their books as our president is with his tax returns. <laughs> so, basically, that's the story of Spinal Tap. And I'm really proud of that because that's, that's, that's an angle that not a lot of people know about. Yeah, I, I I I haven't read about it in depth. I know particularly Harry Shearer has been suing. I've been hearing his name come up a lot in regards to that. But yeah. like, but it it's a similar story to other stories where the yeah. creative side gets fucked. Just like when we were talking about the the writers uh, a couple of weeks back, it it always has to go to arbitration to figure out who wrote the script and who wrote the script, whose name goes up in the credits is not necessarily the person who wrote the script. Yeah. Cause that's how fucked up the system is. Yeah. So I like this story because it's a, it's a story that people don't rightfully know. Speaking of lesser known stories, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before. Yeah. I'm not sure. We did do a Christopher guest movie before we did mascots, which yes. in retrospect was kind of okay. Mm hmm. I remember seeing it when we saw it, but now that I'm thinking back, like I barely remember a thing about that movie. So I guess it was just okay. But speaking of lesser known stories, did you know that Christopher Guest is a freaking lord? No. Yeah, uh, apparently his dad was a British UN diplomat who eventually became the first, the fourth, Lord Honorable Baron Hayden Guest. Wow. So, when Christopher, so when Christopher Guest's dad died in 1996, he inherited the title. So now he is the honorable fourth, the fourth Lord Honorable Baron Hayden Guest <laughs> is his official title. Man, and good on he him. He inherited a lord. Yeah, and he was so excited about that that he even attended a shit ton of House of Lords uh, I don't know what you call them, powwows. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Uh, House of Lords, House of Lords, um, meetings, I guess. Meetings until 1999, when the House of Lords banned hereditary titles from having seats or something. I don't know. This is all British wacky shit. <laughs> so I don't know the specific. Uh, details of their weirdo fucking system, but apparently, well, did it, you he was did you did you know? See, like, obviously, Christopher Guest would have known the whole time that this was going to happen to him eventually. But did you know the guy who played Roger in Dawn of the Dead, the original Dawn of the Dead, 
turned out to have been royalty of a Yugoslavian country. I forget which one. Really? Yes. That's interesting. So he yeah, is, he is actually you... a prince now. Huh. That's some weird, interesting shit. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, uh, Spinal Tap. Great fucking movie. Goddamn hilarious. I saw them in concert um, when I was in high school, I believe. Yeah. Uh, good concert. I don't remember if their fake folk band, the 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 what the folksmen. I don't remember if they opened or not. <laughs> I know they would sometimes. Sometimes they would open for themselves. So I don't remember if they did that or not during the concert. But yeah, yeah great great damn concert. Interesting fact. I was trying to I was trying to figure out some things about Spinal Tap that people might not know. To film the movie, they went for a a, a very realistic look to it. So they got real life rockumentary cinematographer Peter Smokler to do all of the cinematography. He shot fucking Gimme Shelter. Oh. He filmed that entire movie and also a couple of other ones. Uh, Jimmy plays Berkeley. And he yeah. should get a lot more credit because he was the one who was like, okay, I filmed a number of these rockumentaries. I know what they look like. So right here, you need a shaky handheld. You need a grainy footage here. You need yeah. to just... It, it, right here, right to a cool... A zoom in that's going to give it a realistic effect and that's what makes this feel real it's the shit like that that makes this look authentic well the concert footage was so the cinema awesome yeah yeah and a lot of that was him too he really should he really should uh get more credit than he gets for this film yeah personally i think the biggest testament to freaking Spinal Tap success is that so many actual real life mu musicians, so many beloved musicians have all said that A, they love this film, and B, it hits too close to fucking home. Yes. I think that's the real sign of this film's success that, like, the biggest fans of these movies are, of this movie is uh, Jimmy Page and Ozzy Osbourne and Danzig and U2 and uh, Kurt Cobain. Townsend and the rumor was that Guns N' Roses back in their prime like um, uh, Appetite for Destruction and Use Your Illusion and shit mm -hmm. that they would watch Spinal Tap in its entirety before go going on stage <laughs> that was the, that was the rumor that, that I heard and the rumor that they said to people in, in interviews and stuff that one of the reasons why they were always late yeah. for their concerts was just well we have to watch Spinal Tap tap when we get to the <laughs> venue then we go on mm -hmm. anyway I love this goddamn movie I love, love Spinal Tap I love their music I love all of the lovely lads great fucking film 